So welcome everyone to this D, to this DHS2 use case bazaar uh, for the DHS2 uh, annual conference 2020, the digital one. Um, I'm I'm the unofficial host. Uh, Alice is the official host. Uh, she's uh, wrapping wrapping up a session. So I'm I'm starting on her behalf, and she will obviously join us um, as uh, as soon as she can. So um, you've been waiting a, a bit now. So what I suggest is that we start right away. We have twelve presentations. Um, so I will ask uh, each of the presenters, just let me uh, remind the rules, uh, to present, each of the presenters should present for five minutes and then we go to the next. So I'm inviting um, Lucia uh, with, uh, from WHO who's presenting metadata sync, multiple DHS2 instances interacting to timely serve decision making at all levels. And the next to come will be, um, will be Fanatenan uh, from Madagascar, uh, who will present integration of private sector data into the national HMIS approaches and experiences from Madagascar. But first, WHO, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Uh, since we have only five minutes, I'll start right away. Um, we are here today to present to you an application, the DHS2 application that we have developed to facilitate the exchange of metadata and data from one DHS2 instance to one or many others. We were consuming, we were spending a lot of time doing this process in a fairly manual way. We were tired of it and we wanted to find a solution to automatize that exchange of data and metadata. I'm Lucia Fernandez Montoya from WHO and I have with me today Ignacio Foche Perez, which is representing the developer ICT of this application and will be able to respond to your questions. And with us, uh, we have also Ryan Williams from WHO who has been very involved in the development of this application. So what is this application doing? So this application can help us compare and map one DHIS2 instance against one or many other ones, and then send data or metadata from one to one or many others, uh, applying all the necessary transformations on the flight. So based on the mapping we've done, based on the equivalence of the different UIDs or data elements, indicators, or units, the application will transform the data and metadata from the origin instance and send it to the destination or remote instance. And what is best, and is my favorite, uh, you can schedule these processes to happen uh, on a regular basis. So if you have to send metadata or data from your development instances to your production instances, or from a national instance to a regional instance, or from a national instance to a global instance, you can schedule this to happen uh, once a week, once a month, twice a week, uh, in whatever frequency you want. So I wanted to show you a bit of the screenshots because we have respected the look and feel of uh, DHIS2. So the application is easy to use and familiar to all the DHIS2 users. And what you see here is how from one DHIS2 instance where you have this application installed, you can uh, configure a lot of other remote instances where you want to send your data or metadata. And then here at the bottom, you see how you can map the metadata, in this case, you see org units, of your local instance to the IDs or uh, elements of the destination instance that you want to send data or metadata to. So that mapping is then saved uh, under each of the configurations of each of the instances, and then it can be used to uh, send data and metadata. So here you see the process to set up a synchronization rule. So a process of sending data or metadata to the destination instance. So what kind of things can you define? You can select what kind of data elements, what subset of indicators, or what subset of metadata you want to send from your local instance to a destination instance. You can select if you are sending data, for which period you want to send the data, uh, for which organizational units you want to send the data, maybe you don't want to send for all of the org units, and you can aggregate it. So if one instance is collecting data with a much more granular detail, and you want to send that data to another instance that has a broader um, scope, 
then you can aggregate the data that you are sending from, for example, health facility to province level or to national level. And as you see in the step number eight, uh, you can schedule how often this process of sending data or metadata should happen. Uh, once uh, you schedule, you, you set up this process and you have selected what kind of things you want to send from one instance to another one, uh, you have a list of what we call synchronization rules and you can literally just monitor how they are being executed automatically without you doing anything or you can execute them manually or you can download the JSON file that is going to be sent from this uh, synchronization rule, etc. You can also, as usually in DHIS2, you can all modify the sharing settings so that only few uh, subset of users have access to executing these synchronization rules so you can control access to them quite easily. And then once you have uh, synchronized, uh, when the date, once the data is synchronized, when this, once these synchronization rules are run, then you are able to see whether they are successful, whether they have failed, and why they have failed, if there was any changes in the metadata of the origin instance in between, etc. So you have a nice dashboard where you can see these processes uh, either succeeding or, or failing. Uh, and I just wanted to quickly end uh, the super short presentation saying that um, we have broadened the scope of this application very recently. And it not only sends, can send data or metadata from one instance to many others very easily, but now it is able as well to package uh, metadata, to create metadata packages and to uh, offer them to users. So basically we have a couple of widget apps that will be integrated in the DHIS2 dashboards very easily and these, these widgets can provide packages that are contained in the reference uh, in the instance or reference instance where the widget is installed. So we are using this to distribute the WHO standard metadata packages uh, to allow users to explore the packages, to explore the content of the packages uh, and to pull them into their national or uh, whatever instances. So this application since recently not only pushes data out from one instance to many others, but it can pull as well. You can use it to pull data from an instance that you are exploring, visiting, consulting into your own instance. Um, so we are using this application to um, manage our own DHIS2 instance at WHO, uh, transferring data and metadata from dev to pre-prod to production. We are using it to support the countries to do the same in their national environments, to exchange data and metadata from dev to pre-prod, etc. Uh, and we are starting to use it as well to facilitate data reporting so that member states can report data to WHO, just a subset of data, only the few variables and indicators they want, easily from their national instances to uh, our uh, global DHS2 instance, and finally to distribute the WHO standard packages. So this is it for my presentation. I have a bunch of links there so that you can get all the documentation you want. There is a video, there is written documentation. You have a link to the GitHub repo to download the app, an announcement in the community of practice, and our email accounts in case you want to contact us directly with any questions. So thanks to everyone that has participated. As I said, we have Ryan, Nacho, and myself here, but there is a lot of other uh, people that contributed to it, a lot of developers behind this application, and I wanted to thank them before finishing the presentation. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Lucia. You, you, you nailed it in six minutes. That's uh, really, really good. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have two good news. The first one is that you can ask questions on the, on the COP. I put the link in the chat. We'll post it again in a couple of minutes for the people who were not yet, who had not joined uh, while I was uh, sending the first link. I sent it a second time. And the second good news is that you, you were all waiting for Alice to be on board and now she's on the floor, so she will take over. Alice, the floor is yours. And the next to come is from Madagascar. Uh, exactly. From Athena. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mathieu. So we're going to listen to the next uh, presentation, which will focus on integration of private sector data into the national HMIS approaches and experiences from Madagascar. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. I'm Fanat Teman. Ranger uh, Marinsu, it's a bit long and it's a bit difficult. I'm from Madagascar, as it said before, and uh, I'm from the Shops Plus project. 
And today we talk about the integration of a private sector data into the national HMIS um, uh, in Madagascar. So to start, uh, let's talk a little bit about Madagascar. Actually, here we are still transitioning to the exclusive use of uh, the HIS2. The Ministry of Health is now starting the uh, finalizing the process and the tools. And the Ministry also seek inclusion of uh, private sector data because in 219, only 19% of the private facilities are reported to district level. Actually, the facts are that the private facilities are not in the master facility list. The reporting tools are cumbersome and confusing because it's composed of 10 to 12 pages of tables and the indicators should be um, uh, calculated manually. So they don't find any motivation to report. So what is Shops Plus? Actually, Shops Plus is a new CID flagship initiative in private sector health. It's a five-year project, so it, for Madagascar, it will end next year. One of the objectives of the project is to improve the routine reporting by private providers into national HMIS for approaches uh, were used. Let's see the first one. It's about the pu public-private dialogue. For that, we established a private sector platform to, adv to advocate and uh, for peer learning. And we developed a roadmap with the Ministry of Health and private sector. The, the main objective is to improve the reporting from the private sector, but also to include them into the HMRS. So by now, we facilitated five meetings between the two uh, entities. The second approach is about the census that we conducted uh, for the private sector. So we discovered that more th uh, about half of private facilities in Madagascar are located in the capital region, which is a little bit normal. Uh, 1,100 of private facilities are in the capital region and 36% uh, of them have access to a computer and the internet. The third approach is about technical support we provided to private sector. So from the roadmap, we identified that um, the main problem uh, for the private sector to report is the, the tool is um, confusing, cumbersome. So we developed an Excel-based reporting form. So the calculation will be automatic and it will be easier to be sent, but because they just have to send it by email. We also provided training on Excel and paper-based form for private, pro private providers. By now, 107 private facilities from the capital received training. About 50, uh, seven, 70% of the, the submissions from the trained providers are the Excel-based form and 60% of trained private providers have reported at least once after that training. It's um, really low, but um, it, it shows that we still have barriers and challenges for, for reporting from the private sector. The last approach is about the capacity building of public sector. For that, we established two formal agreements with the Ministry of Health from the district level to the national level. This is to integrate the private sector data into the national HMIS, but also we bolster the capacity of the district to accept and uh, process the Excel and paper-based report from the private providers. For that, we provided them equipment, trainings, and uh, technical support. So these are the activities that we have done, but what are next steps then for Shops Plus? So by now we plan to produce and disseminate informational and promotional videos for reporting. This is to make the tool available at any time, anywhere, at any level, at, uh, and uh, from the public sector and the private sector. We'll continue trainings. We we'll continue supporting the health district with data processing. We'll ensure that all the information we gathered from the census will be entered into the DHIS2, and we'll ensure that, that all activities will be sustainable once Shop, Shops Plus ends. So these are our realization, our um, perspective that we, want, uh, we wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Fana. Uh, now we're going to hear to the Third presentation from Rosario Martinez Vega, MSF Spain. Rosario, you have the floor. Thank you.
Okay, can you all hear? Can you, can you all see my presentation now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rosario Martinez. I'm the health epidemiologist in MSF Spain. And we are going to present our use case, which is in service mobile data collection for automatic integration of individual data in MSF HMIS. So why did we do this pilot? Just to give you some background. So in MSF Spain, we developed our HMIS back in 2014, based in DHIS2, and we did the full implementation in 2015. So in 2018, four years later, we decided to do an exercise of evaluation in collaboration with the University of Oslo, trying to understand which were the main challenges faced by the field user regarding data collection and data analysis. So the main challenge we found was that data collection um, process was identified as repetitive, time consuming and prone to human errors. So uh, this affects a lot the user acceptance and the data quality. And then basically the users have very little trust in data and therefore they didn't use the data much. So what did we do? So the solution in response to this challenge, so we designed and piloted a system trying to assess the use of tablet for improving in-service data collection. So the, um, the system consisted of the DHIS2 Android app for data collection of individual registries and a custom web app that integrated those records into the, the DHIS2 has aggregated data. In order to do that, we need to map all existing registry book to be sure that all the data that the, the users need to collect, to, to collect, they were integrated into the app. But actually, what did the user could see in the hospital? So this is the normal data flow that you all know. Uh, we have the clinical files, then we, we enter every patient in the registry book, then we do a, a we weekly tally all the data, then we enter into HMIS, and then we synchronize with the server. And all of these, the three first st steps happen at facility level, and the last two steps at project level. So what we do with our, uh, with our proposal was we keep the, the first two steps, but then we enter directly the data from the registry book into the tablet, and then we synchronize with the server. So we basically skip this, uh, these two steps who were identified already as a, like very time consuming, a very prone to errors. We could also have uh, skipped this step of the registry book, but we decided not to do it because it was a pilot and the people in the field really trust the registry book. So we decided to, to keep it, but it was truly really duplicating the work. So how did we pilot it? So we piloted the solution in seven inpatient services in Malakal Town and POC hospitals in South Sudan for four months. This is the setup of the tablet in the, in the different words, where you can see we, we leave it the, the tablet um, in the words, and these are the pictures from the two different hospitals. We went to the field and we did a, a hands-on training for two weeks. We trained the usual staff that they were working before this pilot with the data, who in case of Malakal was the national staff they were the next supervisors. And then we left after two weeks. So the remote monitoring phase started, the user uh, worked independently, and we provide remote support. At the end of the four months of the, of the pilot, we did an evaluation to assay the mobile data collection as an alternative to the previous manual paper-based approach. So we did focus group, we did uh, surveys, and we also uh, did like a qualitative analysis with HMIS data. God, what did we learn from it? So we learned that mobile technology to support data collection seemed to be feasible and acceptable in IPD facilities. So all the participants mentioned that it was easy to use the app, to use the app. it was easy to use the tablet, and they felt comfortable having the tablet in the, in the world, in the everyday today. Uh, what would, did we learn about efficiency? So collecting data in the tablet and running automatic aggregation was faster than the previous manual process. Regarding effectiveness, the ease of data collection process improved, mainly due to the replacement of the manual aggregation. The completeness of the data did not change substantially, even though all the users have the feeling that uh, the data was more complete, but it didn't happen, happen in the evaluation, but uh, the timely reporting really improved. And finally, regarding quality, data accuracy improved significantly. So very important uh, indicators for monitoring the activities in the field, such as bed occupancy rate, inpatient uh, length of stay, a total of admission really, really improved. The data was better and more accurate. And the introduction of processes in the pre-data entry phase had a great impact on data quality. So the conclusions of this pilot was like bringing technology closer to where the data is generated appears to simplify data collection and improve data quality. 
and that the automatic aggregation of DHI is to reduce manual steps seems to improve user motivations toward data collection. But also, of course, we also have challenges during the pilot. One was the provision of technical support remotely. Uh, the second one was the hardware management. So we have to bring the tablet every day to the hospital and bring it back every evening. The digital skill of the user, which varies uh, a lot from person to person. And finally, the custom web app robustness. And which are the next steps? The first is the potential of analyzing the individual data. We were trying to, to pilot with the solution was the aggregation of data. So the, the user only have access to aggregated data. But in fact, we have individual data and we haven't explored the potential of that and we know that it's a lot. So that will be the next step. Uh, second was leveraging mobile device presence in the facility for other health services. So we, we piloted in IPD, but there is other services like, for example, emergency room that for sure will benefit a lot from the solution. And the last one, so uh, further use of the application. So this is a sentence that we get from one of the participants uh, in the interviews. And he said, I've worked with data for many years. Coming to MSF and working with tally sheets to me was like going back to the 80s. We're in a society with data collection tools where tally sheets are not a tool anymore. So this was a very important lesson learned for us. I think as in MSF, we're always afraid to bring technology to the field because people are very busy. We think that they may prefer to use the, the old ways. But what we saw is, is no. I mean, the staff in the field, they ask us for tools to help them to go through the day-to-day, -to, -day, to make the day-to-day -day easier and, uh, and to make their job more reliable. So I think we should be more, we should be more courageous with this. And, uh, and just to give a thank you to all the co-authors and all the participants in the pilot, but especially the people who participate from Malakal project. And, um, and thank you to all of you. Dan. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so, as mentioned earlier, once again, any questions, please go onto the COP page and you can directly ask, I mean, directly write your questions there. We will make sure to reply. Now we're going to hear the next presentation from Romain Roland Touri on can technology, presenting, sorry, uh, the following subject. Can technology turn the data use dream into reality? Case of malaria scorecard and dashboard mobile apps. Romain? You can go ahead. Okay, I was trying to find the mic. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. So, uh, we don't have too much time, but uh, so quickly, um, the, what is this about is um, we decided to bring some um, the, the use of malaria data uh, closer to to the users, um, and um, we let's go this way. Yeah, so um, we try to tackle some user use cases like for instance at the district level then the district staff want to do some supervision at the facility level they need some um, they need some facility data handy so that they can use to do some uh, data review and, and other things. And facility staff as well they, they sometimes need to have uh, the uh, data ready to do some performance assessment, assessment or some planning and this kind of stuff. And uh, we, uh, we started the, uh, from the assumption that the users um, at the decentralized level, they are usually not comfortable building some visualization uh, themselves, themselves and they are also not very comfortable uh, using the na native DHIS2 visualization tools, or sometimes they don't even have access to, to these tools to build their own dashboard and things like that. So, uh, and, and, and in most of the case, we don't have a permanent uh, access to internet. And when we go um, in supervision, they just maybe not have access to internet at all. So we are targeting uh, users from district level and facility level and even community level. And for that, what we did uh, was first to uh, have our um, PMI measure evaluation um, um, uh, data use expert put together a series of indicators per data set and domain. 
and, and, and try to see what are the most relevant indicators. So we, I have a list of indicators here. So in the interest of the time, of time, you can check that later on, on, the, on, on the presentation. So we did some um, list of indicators for the, for the first tool that is called the dashboard. It's generating a set, a set of graphs, that's a dashboard. And we have a, a second list of indicator that is specifically for a, a scorecard. And so for the scorecard, the difference is that in addition to the indicator, we also have um, some target like achieve in progress and or not in track. So we have this set of, uh, this set of indicators and now uh, we use that to build a specific DHS2 uh, app. So we actually built two DHS2 app one that is generating a dashboard for malaria data to be used, and, and one that is developing a scorecard. I will start, uh, first start with uh, uh, malaria one. It's, a, it's composed on a web base and a mobile uh, uh, app. So for the web base, uh, we use React, and you can see. And as usual, you can start it like this. And then you have a first screen that allows you to match uh, the set of indicators that I presented earlier with what you have in, in your DHS2 system. And then um, you can select uh, the relative period or fixed period as usual and your org in it. And then it generates a, a predefined dashboard for you and you can use it on the web. Um, and each of the graphs you can have some uh, detail you can play with them. And then uh, we developed a mobile uh, app that can go with that uh, uh, web app. So the web app is also acting as backend to configure the mobile app. So uh, with the mobile app, you, you, it's this is what, how it's present itself. I mean, it's uh, an app that allows you to uh, connect any DHS to instance that already has the web app installed. And uh, it can also manage several uh, servers and you have access to all the data set here and then uh, you can select your org in it and when you submit the data will uh, actually uh, will actually log uh, design the the, uh, the dashboard and uh, uh, one cool feature in with the app is that you can share your data your your graph or your dashboard in uh, using social media installed on your on your mobile device um, and the app has a offline mode as well so uh, we don't want to uh, overload your phone so it's only the data that you are interested in that is uplo uh, uploaded in your mobile phone and even if you are not connected to internet you can access it so, and we have the same also for the scorecard application, a web app uh, version that uh, you can use uh, to first uh, configure, uh, match your org unit, and then mark, uh, match your, your, your indicators, and then set up uh, the, 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 the targets. And then from there, you can generate, um, uh, you can generate your scorecard based on the org unit that you want to see. And when you have it, you can use your mobile phone as well and install the app on it. And you can see the matching of the different, uh, of those different um, 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 indicators. And from there, you can um, select your org unit and the period you want, and then it generates uh, the, the, the scorecard on your mobile phone. And you can also share that uh, scorecard uh, with uh, other uh, followers on social media. And uh, yeah, so I went very quickly because in the interest of the time, but this is our team and uh, we uh, have some uh, videos on YouTube and things like that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Roma. Thank you for this presentation. Now we're going to hear the next presenter who is Moro Tobin. Moro is going to present on using middleware to connect DHIS2 for TB and AMR in country implementation experiences. Moro, you have the floor. 
Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, let me set my starter and uh, try and get through this in five minutes. My name is uh, Mo Tobin. I'm a senior technical officer at Find uh, Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. And uh, what I really want to talk about is how we've put uh, interoperability in the heart of our DHIS2 implementations um, for TB and antimicrobial resistance um, in, in, in our country implementations. So very quickly, if I can uh, get this to change, um, just FIND at a, at a glance. Um, FIND is an NGO uh, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, um, and is principally uh, focused on uh, diagnostic developments uh, and infectious disease. Um, I work in the connectivity and interoperability area, and our focus is on mobilizing health data in order really to fight disease. And what we have done is really challenged ourselves um, with these implementations to do a number of things. And one of them principally is to avoid the burden of manual data collection. Um, everyone is data hungry. Um, issues like antimicrobial resistance demand uh, enormous amounts of data from many different areas and we are focused on automation. We do not want to add burden uh, to already incredibly busy healthcare uh, professionals. So that's one of a, a couple of um, sort of mantras that really drive our work, including simplifying implementation and creating solutions that are integrated across multiple components but are manageable. Uh, our two use cases for our projects have uh, been um, antimicrobial resistance surveillance, so looking at pathogens and drug susceptibility testing, uh, and also uh, looking at TB management. So they seem quite dis different um, disease issues, uh, but from a technology perspective, they're really about working with uh, diverse data sets and trying to map them into services that allow you to to manage the various uh, conditions so for for amr it's very much about this complicated isolate uh, drug susceptibility testing results um, coming from multiple data sources whether they be human health animal health antibiotic usage uh, on the one hand and then with uh, the in the tb area very much about connecting fleets of diagnostic devices and being able to run that data source into multiple endpoints, which may be focused on case management, network management, surveillance. Um, so our technology solution has put interoperability in the center of the picture so that we can map from these multiple input sources into DHIS2 and maintain a tight integration between what's effectively an end-to-end -end data model that, that allows data from these different sources to, to flow through uh, and then integrate into things like the WHO TB apps, uh, into our own bespoke dashboards, um, and also into existing um, services, in-country analytics products. Um, uh, the interoperability also supports a kind of machine to machine uh, data exchange so we can look at things like um, integrating into products such as Redcap or Open Clinica um, as well as into other health uh, management systems. So um, what does all this uh, kind of taught us? What we've ended up, up doing is building a, a effectively a reusable platform out of these major open source components with these end-to-end -end metadata packages that uh, sit across those components that we have found that with our work in Zambia and in Senegal that we have been able to uh, develop innovations in those countries and then that those countries can then inherit those innovations. So we're starting to compile a, um, a reusable, deployable um, service that is, that is built on the innovations and learnings from, from the, each of the individual and country projects. And the big thing we learned really from the AMR work is that we managed in our first country, we spent 12 months developing indicators, dashboards and integrations. Uh, the next country was 12 weeks. 
and we think we can bring that down to 12 days. Um, so in all this work, we have developed um, you know, quite a capability. It's quite far ranging uh, in, in what it can do with connectivity and interoperability. And we hope to uh, be able to roll that out in a lot more uh, countries, a lot more use cases, and get a lot more time so I can come and tell you in more detail about how this works. Uh, the final thing is to say thank you and acknowledgement to our donors, uh, country partners, and the project group, uh, eShift partners particularly, and Software for Health Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mo. So next presenter is Nora Stoops uh, from East South Africa. So Nora is going to present on uni UNICEF landscape analysis of routine nutrition data in Eastern and Southern Africa, the final outcome. Nora, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are we good to go? Yes, we are. Maybe the presenter mode and then good to go. I'm like Arthur. <laughs> Picked it. <laughs> but we got there. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I presented the interim results at last year's um, conference and I thought that I would wrap up with what happened uh, at the end, the final outcome, and I'd like to acknowledge Mara and Maria. So this was the background, it's the normal things of having a look and how can UNICEF do better, and also to look at a global and regional standard set of indicators because nutrition is still a little bit in the weeds. This is the map of uh, Eastern and Southern Africa for the UNICEF region. 18 countries are using DHIS2, two have subsequently migrated to that and it just leaves us with one lone little country that does not have a system for aggregated data and they understand that they're in problem and of course there's also the issues with three languages. So um, in order to do this assessment of looking at routine nutrition data, I needed access to DHIS2. And then I also looked um, was what policy documents, what indicators did they use, aspects related to data quality, how did they use it, and other information systems. So here we just have a list of all the countries, um, who was using, what was using, what sort of rights and what sort of access did I have to DHIS2 to, to do an assessment. So some of the key findings were the main one was that there were supplementary nutrition information systems. And one of the reason for this was that they were easier to access, um, easier to get changed, um, easier to adapt to local needs and everybody worked together. And a supplementary is not a parallel. It contained different sets of data. Um, there was use of information with review meetings and now ever looking up at looking at DHIS to substantial problems. Um, data was collected, not used. Indicator construction, I want to cry. Um, and the other bad news was that so many people did not have access to basic apps. The data quality app is not available to them. The map app is not available to them. And lots of people wanted training. The other thing that we identified was, well, when did you last update your nutrition indicators? And then we sort of looked at, well, when are you revising? What's the sort of timeline? Because we know data needs change over time. And 13 countries did not have a date to do this. And seven countries have a set timeline. In other words, they have a policy that says, we will update our whole set of indicators, data elements, and everything else. Access to DHIS2 and dashboards. Only 10 countries provided access. The others, we had to do sorts of all sorts of fun things. And very few countries had a functional nutrition dashboard. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done 
about how do you get data out in a format that people can use. People were using the data that was very, that came across everywhere very strongly. The other in the scary thing was that the version of DHIS2 being used uh, in when we did the final sort of count in November, less than 2.3, there were five countries. 2.27, um, 2.28, those are very old bills. There was no upkeep for them, but countries hadn't changed yet. So this was a big issue that not updating the bills. And if you want to get this report online, here it is. Thank you, that's all from me. Thank you so much, Nora. We're going to hear now the next presentation, um, which is from Caroline Bain from PATH, who will be presenting Trace to Treat Tracking Breast Cancer Patients in Peru with DHIS2. Caroline, you have the floor, thank you so much. Hello, and um, I guess it's good afternoon to everyone. It's good morning from me. I am Carolyn Bain, as she said. I'm a senior program officer at PATH and focused on detecting breast cancer in low resources areas. So in this point, we're working in Peru, and I'm happy to tell you about the tracking breast cancer patients with DHIS2. We've just started this year, and here's the poster on the left. And I think everyone knows that Peru is in South America on the West Coast, but I'll show you where Trujillo is. Um, Lima is there with a the star, and then Trujillo is about one hour flight or an eight hour bus ride up to the north on the Pacific Coast. And we've been scaling up this breast cancer model for the past four years, since 2016. And the model is, um, for places where women do not have regular access to mammograms. So there are a lot of places in the world where though there might be mammograms in the main capital city, they're not necessarily in the regional areas. So we're focused this model on bringing um, breast cancer detection to women in those situations through, you see along the red access, community education, teaching women about the risks and signs and symptoms of breast cancer encouraging them to go for a clinical breast exam um, every year, and that is available in their neighborhood clinic with their midwives that have been trained. If the midwife was to find a suspicious uh, mass, they would be sent on for an ultrasound triage, which could detect whether it was just a simple cyst and then could be just drained and not followed up any further. But if they still see a, a suspicious mass, they do a fine needle biopsy. And then that slide is sent on to the Regional Cancer for Center for evaluation by the pathologist. And they would have definitive diagnosis and treatment also at the Regional Cancer Center. So this model of using clinical breast exam, triage, and um, fine needle aspiration biopsy has been resource appropriate and accepted by women and providers. We do see about 6,000 women in Trujillo per year, age 40 to 69, evaluated for breast cancer. And so far, everything has been done just in paper-based forms, which is a recurrent theme I've seen here in the DHIS2 um, conference. And that's what we're addressing as well, is trying to get that digitized for real-time follow-up. We've had an excellent collaboration um, between PATH and the Peruvian Regional Ministry of Health, which is Teresa La Libertad and the City of Trujillo's Health Network, La Red de Salud Trujillo. And ECAS in Spain has been building the system. So we have weekly meetings and I just can't highlight that enough as an excellent um, way forward. The system design is set up to address these three different levels of the um, clinic, the government health system. From the first level where the clinical breast exam is done, the midwives will be trained to input the data about the clinical breast exam at that neighborhood clinic. And then if they're sent on for a follow-up, the secondary level hospital would also input the ultrasound triage and the fine needle aspiration data. 
And finally, the third level where the diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment would be um, input. We will have that information as well. This is very exciting for us because we have never seen everything in real time and connected to show all this information about the woman in her breast cancer detection pathway. So it's a very exciting moment. Um, we have had to pivot from what was going to be in hands-on training in person um, to virtual because of COVID-19. And so we've done Zoom and Moodle and we'll continue to do that. In fact, next week we have a, another training starting up. And the DHIS2 Capture app can be used for clinics that lack the stable internet. Here is uh, what we'll be collecting as far as data and charts. These are just placeholders because due to COVID-19, we haven't had the breast cancer screening going on. I think most of the world has put their cancer screening on hold as COVID-19 has been the priority, but they are starting up now um, soon. And we hope in the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, we will have data on all these areas, the clinical breast exams, the um, ultrasound, the biopsies, diagnosis, treatment type, and initiation, etc. And then um, some of the highlights here too is this is one of the few DHIS2 implementations in Spanish, and one few few in Latin America. In fact, it's been a great iterative process, sustainable, and we hope will be used in the public sector. Um, has a user-friendly approach. And we are piloting in 14 health centers and the Regional Cancer Institute to engage at least 800 women. But the whole city of Trujillo has 58 health centers. So with a successful evaluation, we hope to reach those other 44 uh, health centers and that the regional government would be in charge of that and the health system. So we're hopeful for that. I want to thank all my collaborators at PATH and um, in Peru and in Spain, and also acknowledge the Pfizer Foundation support. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear Uriba from PATH um, on the following presentation, creating integrated surveillance across human and animal health sectors using THIS2, the OHMIS system. Uri, please yeah. go ahead. Good, thank you. Thank can you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You see my screen, please. Yes. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Maybe you want to put the presenter mode, sorry. Presenter mode. Slideshow. Yeah. At the top. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I'm Uriba, health informatics specialist. I work for IDDS project. The IDDS stands for uh, Infectious Disease Detection and Surveillance Project funded by USAID. I will going to present uh, the OHMIS system. This OHMIS system is uh, the system that we implement in, in Senegal and uh, in other countries supported by IDS project. So the goal of this uh, project is to uh, to help help all the national national government to have uh, both animal and the human priority zoonotic diseases that are in the same platform using DHIS2. So in this presentation, all data we are used is generated randomly uh, using Senegal population and geography. So let's see the methodology. First, we start by Identify and uh, assess all the priority zoonotic diseases in uh, the, the supported country, the idea supported country project. And we develop, we create and develop the, the data collection tool we, that we configure into the HIS tool. So that we generate dummy data for test 
for rare bees cases and uh, animal bites to export and we export this data in to search scan for doing analysis to see uh, the, the, the cluster events. So here you have the data entry form developed into DHIS2. The first one is the human data collection form and the second is the animal side. In the animal side, just what I want to mention is uh, we need to classify uh, diseases by animal species. So here the result of the SASCAN analysis, here we have the cluster. The, lo the low cluster is represented by dark dots and the higher is uh, represented by the red one. So we can also uh, cycle in the cluster zones. Okay, let's see what will be the, the next step. The next step will be to, to configure uh, this uh, platform and uh, integrate it uh, with uh, R to have uh, real-time real -time analysis and uh, to automate some analysis into DHIS to integrate data visualization. And uh, after that, it will to select uh, DHIS, uh, IDDS project country to pilot this system and uh, to see how to implement it in, uh, a, in by, uh, to implement it in one of the countries supported by IDDS. So the goal is to avoid any data sharing issues uh, in, in the animal and the human side, because when we talk about data infectious diseases or one health approach, we need to have one platform that help us to collect even human and animal diseases in the same platform. So for the, to host in this platform, the government or the national government can uh, choice, choose to, to host system in the Ministry of Technology or in the, another third party, it's depend on the country politics. And uh, I, to finalize, I just want to thank all my colleagues, uh, Michael and uh, Lindsay and uh, Roland, who helps us to 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 set up this uh, this abstract and uh, to continue we continue to work on this uh, project and we will uh, let you know what will be the, the results. Thank you. And uh, it's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, once again, if you have any questions, please go on the COP and you can uh, write your questions. We will make sure you receive an answer. Now let's hear from our next presenter, sorry. Um, Brigan Mualwanda from the Malawi MOH, uh, who is going to present Surveillance for All, how to circumvent the barrier of network penetration and bring COVID surveillance to the masses. Case from Malawi. Oh, let's stop this sharing. Yes. Briwan, please go ahead. You can share your screen. Hello, everyone. Um, I believe you can see my screen. We can see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello again. I'm Wiani Moranda here uh, from the Ministry of Health Malawi. Um, I work under the Quality Management Directorate in the Ministry, um, and this is my presentation. Now, as the title says, this uh, this involves work we did with um, yeah, during the COVID-19 pandemic, or as we are at now. Um, and we were trying to 
look for ways in which we could bring uh, COVID-19 surveillance to everybody, regardless of um, who they are, um, you know, in, a, in an efficient way as possible. Now, as a background, um, you know, as a country, Malawi, we're working on setting up the One Health Surveillance Platform by leveraging the DHS to track implementation or a tracker program. And then that was um, on track. Um, but then with the advent of COVID-19, that work was fast tracked um, and focused towards COVID-19 so that we can cut off the issues that were you know, arising in terms of you know, surveillance um, with the outbreak. And then that's, um, that, that's when we had diverged from the initial implementation to what we have now as um, you know, One Health Surveillance. Um, now, looking at the landscape of Malawi in terms of network penetration and the challenge that we had, um, you know, as of January 2020, Malawi has a population of about 18 million. And then apart, you know, out of that 18 million, we have 8.58 million um, people who have at least mobile phones. Um, that's just a mobile phone, regardless of what form factor it is. And then from that 8.58 million, we have um, about 2.81 million of people who have uh, mobile phones that enable them to connect to the internet. And then we needed a way or a solution to fill the gap that was in between the 8.58 and the 2.81 million, um, you know, so that we can also provide surveillance for um, the people in that gap. And speaking of the challenge, to your right um, of the screen, that's what our challenge was more or less like, um, because such devices are what uh, most common within the population in the country, and then we needed to leverage the, you know, the capabilities of such devices um, for people using those, so that they can also be able to um, report or monitor what's happening with the, you know, during the pandemic. Um, now, the solution that we came up with with regards to that was we built. Um, you know, an SMS and you know, USSD, you know, we built SMS and USSD platforms on top of the capabilities of the DHS tracker so that we can, you know, register, uh, we can register the entities, which are the, you know, the, the people in this case, we can, you know, have them submit their symptoms, have them uh, check the statistics of the, uh, you know, the pandemic both nationally and globally. And then that was at least uh, you know, what we were able to achieve as the first iteration of the implementations. Um, as an example, that's, you know, um, I, 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 I took the liberty of taking the screenshots for the two implementations in action. And on the far left, you see the SMS Rapid Pro implementation, which you know, shows a few menus um, regarding on what you can do with the app. And then on the right, you have the USS implementation, which also has basically a menu um, showing you on what the app is more or less capable of doing. Um, and, you know, as a summary, um, we, this is how it all looks like fit together um, when all is in action. And maybe I was trying to find out, I was trying to look for the pointer, but you should focus on the middle section where you have Rapid Pro uh, UNICEF. So that's basically what you would look into. Apart from that implementation, there is the Anchor Dimension WhatsApp chatbot, but that assumes that people are, you know, people are connected to the internet, which we were trying to, you know, avoid when we were coming up with this implementation. So the good thing about SMS and USSD, as you might be aware, is that they work on any device regardless of what form factor it is. So, you know, connected or not connected to the internet, you should be able to use the key functionalities of those two platforms and then you know also ride on top of the um the implementations that other people would be using using phones um that have you know whatsapp or directly using the dhs to track um, capture mobile you know application um and then you know moving further to the challenges and lessons learned now in terms of the challenges we had a few things going on in, in, in that regard. And you know, much of it was to do with how do we synchronize the, um, the data coming in from the different applications. So we had data coming in from the WhatsApp chatbot. We had some coming in from the SMS application and one from the USSD implementation. You know, this is a case where somebody 
you know, in the morning or today, one would use a WhatsApp chatbot. Um, tomorrow, they would use the USSG application. And if you don't cut up for those right, you'd find that you would have duplicate entries in the, in, in the platform. And that was um, maybe one of the challenges that we had and had to work around. And the other one was collaborating with different partners while trying to achieve this you know, data sharing. Um, and you know, that, that, that was brought about because those applications were not built by one player and they were built by several players as you know, helping out the ministry. So we had a few things going on in terms of how to consolidate that information um, while not you know, disregarding a few things. And then um, as, a, as a way forward and as a you know, less, you know, way forward from the lessons learned, we saw that it was, it's, it's very nice to you know, adapt much of our implementations to comply to international standards as possible. And that's what we will be working on um, you know, you know, you know, from, the, from the project going forward. So that's, that's about it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Now we're going to hear the next presenter. Ibrahim Kamarao is, present, is going to present Sierra Leone, the rise and fall of the HMIS DHIS2 datasets. Ibrahim. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Let me You're just welcome. try to share my screen. Yes. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, we can. All right. So, um, my name is Ibrahim Kamara. I work as a um, data manager for the Ministry of Health and Sanitation in Sierra Leone. And I'm co-presenting the rise and fall in size of the DHIS2 database. I want to start by acknowledging Nora and Khalif for their contribution to this work. What's happening? All right. So um, Sierra Leone, in case you don't know, is well known for being the demo site for DHIS2 testing, as well as leading on the EIDSR in the sub-region. Um, we actually started using the DHIS2 offline system in 2008. And in 2013, we moved to an online system, whereby trying to integrate all program data into the DHIS2 system. And at this time, we had more than 3,000 data cells that are required to be completed and reported on a monthly basis. And because of the decision to integrate all program data into the DHIS, we had to revise our form, forms around 2018 to 2019 to capture all programs data as well as having separate data sets for HIV and TB program. So in 2013, we had a lot of data collection tools that included age and, and, and gender disaggregation. This actually affected the quality of our DHIS2 data system, especially in terms of um, completeness and that of timeliness. So what happened, most of our health facilities could not summarize and submit their summary forms on a monthly basis, um, targeting the 15th of every month. And we also realized that there, there is a lot of data inconsistency issue between what is reported in the, what is in the register compared to what is in the summary form and that of the DHIS2. So at around this time, we realized that the data cells we have for the clinic registers was 2,199, and the one we had for the hospital um, registers, summary, sorry, was 1,142, and that for the HIV was 923. So in 2018, we, we had to do some revision, especially targeting the hospital data sets. So we, we increased um, the data um, age disaggregation as well as included um, sex to the summary forms. So as a result, we increased the data cells for the hospital forms from 1,000 to 8,000 in 2018. So in 2019, we, we did another form, re, form revision and this was because of the increase in data quality issues and we also realized that we have a lot of data elements that we've never analyzed or used to make any decision. So on that note, we use the WHO facility guide for malaria, EPI, and RMNCH as one of our guides documents to conduct the exercise. We remove all, we collapse all ages 
uh, age disaggregation as well as remove some um, um, gender in some of the data elements that we think are not useful. We ensured in all this process, we ensured we involve the participation of the programs as well as the health partners in all stages of the process. And so presently we have 1,616 1, 1, data cells in our monthly HIS2 system. And we have conducted trainings for the newly revised suits and the health facility staff are very much excited about the changes we made. So at this point, I want to um, ask Nora Stoops to at least continue from this process, from this point. Nora, are you there? Yes, Ibrahim, thank you. Uh, I think that it's the rise and fall, but the rise again of Sierra Leone. And this summary table shows us where we were, what we went to, and what we've come down as. And I think that the, the process followed is crucial for countries that are looking to reduce their maximum data sets. Uh, the support of the Ministry of Health in revising these, in revisiting things and relooking it was crucial. It couldn't have been done without them. So we now have a set of tools for all of these different services. We have the registers and um, as I say, the training has started and hopefully will be continued and full roll out. And uh, as Ibram said, yes, the clinic staff are very happy with the reduction in the number of data cells to be completed every month. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim and Nora. Now let's hear to the final presentation of the session from Ryan Williams from the WHO is going to present D2 Docker, making DHIS2 accessible to everyone. Ryan, you have the floor. Yes, hi. Can you, hear, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Now no? we can see it. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Williams. I'm a surveillance officer um, at WHO working in the Global Malaria Program. And today I would like to talk about the D2 Docker, making DHS2 more accessible to non-IT specialists. The D2 Docker was developed by uh, ICT, which you, who is represented today by Nacho, who is online and is available for any technical questions. Uh, Lucia Fernandez, who presented the metadata application, was very involved in the development of this tool, in case you want to contact her as well. So the problem, installing and running a DHIS2 instance is not accessible to most people. It requires a certain level of IT knowledge and IT infrastructure, often lacking in, um, uh, among health uh, specialists and professionals. This limits the health professional's capacity to innovate and to use the tool and hampers the full potential and the possibilities to improve uh, on the health information system. How many times during uh, workshops or after presentations I've been approached about uh, DHIS2, uh, the participants say it's a great tool, how can I get it? Some even have access to DHIS2 via their country's national HMIS system or other instances, but they uh, typically don't have enough rights to do much um, other than maybe enter data and create some reports. This is not exploiting the full possibility or potential of uh, DHIS2. And um, they would like to know how to get uh, DHIS2 on their machine to use it more in depth. And most often what they are, they're asking is to get the same implementation that has been either presented in the presentation or used during the workshop. So if I can give a, a, a make a, a use Excel as an example, they would like, or they would not like to have an empty Excel sheet. They would like to have the pivot tables with the fancy charts and filters and slicers that they can use, um, like they can plug in their own data and play around with, a bit, play around with it a bit and um, experience different possibilities. Unfortunately, DHIS2 is not readily installable and configurable by most of these health professionals. So how do we provide them access? Well, solution is D2 Docker which is a command line tool that allows you to manage a DHIS2 instance. So you can start from scratch or you can start from an existing uh, installation 
uh, located in a registry uh, in the cloud or Docker Hub. So you can work locally on this instance on your desktop or laptop. You can save your work, you can do versioning, you can publish your work, and you can share it. All this without being too complicated using a set of simplified commands. So what is the Docker mentioned in D2 Docker? Well, Docker is a technology that already exists. It is like a virtual machine. It's a tool that is, that's been designed to create, deploy, and run application using containers. Now these containers are a packaging of all the parts required for an application to run. So what does this mean concerning DHIS2 is that within this image or container, you have DHIS2, its database, its web server, and so on. So everything is encapsulated inside uh, this image. This image is uploaded to the cloud where it lives, and you can then download it and run DHIS2 on your machine. Of course, this requires the Docker application, application but it's no big deal to install. You can see here in the middle of this image, there's a Docker hub. This is where the images or uh, containers are published. The different versions are, are, are located there and you can make them accessible to your clients. The Docker hub is an um, uh, example of a registry. There are many others. It's similar to a GitHub, but for, for Dockers. One of the simplest, um, I should say, pictures I've seen of uh, Docker without getting into much detail, uh, I found on the web is this one, which shows the Docker client and the host, which is normally sitting on your machine and interacting with the registry, which is in the cloud, where the different versions of DHIS2 that we place will be hosted or different applications or different implementation will be hosted and the client can then go and perform certain operations like um, load and to, that's where they publish and that's where they will um, save their information too. So how does D2Docker work? D2Docker is a wrapper that um, wraps over the Docker and Docker Compose that, and this manages the DHIS2 server instances from the command line. Docker 2. D2 Docker is implemented in Python 3. No knowledge of Docker containers are required. The D2 Docker uses four containers, two custom images. The main thing to know from here is that one is the core and one is the data. Now the core contains what uh, the applications and the data is the data that you can load from a, a, a backup of an existing DHIS2 server or you can start from scratch. It only takes a few minutes to load. You can store images and track changes using any Docker registry. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, Docker Hub was the registry that we use. And with this command line, uh, which has been simplified, you don't need to know how to build your own containers or how to configure this Docker. You just pull from existing images and that will be your starting point. So how do we use it at WHO? We use it to create specialized packages in specific versions of uh, DHIS2 for countries. So this can include uh, our EPI modules, ENTO modules, and any specific modules that we create. An example is we would create, uh, say install a version of DHIS2, say 2.30, for example, we will install then the ENTO module, and then we'll make it specifically uh, the installation for Mozambique. And this will also, also, as a second example, could be version 3.4, EPI model for Ghana. Here you see that our naming convention has the ISO two-letter code for each country. Now from the generic package, we tailor it to a specific location. We then modify this package, save and upload it to the uh, Docker Hub. So this allows us to um, readily develop and modify um, the DHJ instance for specific situations, make revisions and updates, and to readily share it with our clients, which are uh, countries, national malaria control programs, and so on. So it's very useful for development extremely useful for testing and training. An example that we use it recently for migrating our data from one version of DHIS2 to another. And also we used it to change server and also very helpful for developing apps all running on your local machine. Here's an example, typically what I just mentioned, a specific version has been, uh, DHIS2 has been installed. We load the Intel module into this virtual machine, we make our changes, we save, publish to the Docker Hub, where we have our repository, a WHO repository. And there um, we would assign access to a client in Mozambique, and there they can pull the image from the Docker Hub 
and readily have this version that we designed up and running on their machine locally. The simplified set of commands. Um, this is not a complete list, but it's, uh, it's basically what you need. I mentioned earlier that you have two basic images, the core, which represents the actual DHIS2, includes the version. The first um, command is to create that core. You can create it uh, from an existing uh, um, WAR file on your local machine, or it can be downloaded from the web directly. And then the data itself, the second command, you create the data. Now the create data uh, command can actually read in uh, an SQL uh, backup of an existing server that you already have. This could, do, could be your uh, HMIS, this could be um, something that we share or someone else shares with you can be loaded as the data side of that um, DHIS2 installation. Both of these combined will be your particular uh, DHIS2 instance. Then you can start the image using the start command, which pulls a new image from the server. Uh, the command line indicates the name of the um, file you want to, or the version you want to pull. And if it's already on your machine, then it would load up that version. And if it's not there, it will look into the hub and pull the latest version that's available. Then there's the stop command, which stops the server, the commit and push. Now commit will then save the changes you've made and still maintain it on your local machine. Push will then publish it to the server. So back to the cloud, available for others to, to load and to um, pull down to their machines and work off. You can also export your work to a file. You can import from a file and you can run SQL commands against the database running inside the, um, the application. So key points, no knowledge of Docker containers needed. This has been pre-configured for you by, um, by us, uh, by ICT, um, by whoever who has knowledge of this. The end user ha has no need to know anything about these Docker containers. No need to know how about how this thing is built. It's been done for you. The simplified set of commands that allow you to load, download, modify, save, and share your work makes it more accessible to health professionals and gives them uh, the access to create, improve, and innovate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. So we are now at the end of our session. So thank you to each of you uh, who have attended this uh, very interesting session. It's, it's now the end of the day, so what I would like to do, because normally the use case puzzle is also, is also the opportunity for each of us to meet, right? Uh, to, to this year, it's not possible to do it. But however, I would like to invite each of you to switch on your camera so that we can say goodbye in image. Yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you to everyone and hopefully we will meet again. We'll see each other tomorrow for the final day of the EF annual conference. Any questions, do not hesitate to add to, to write them on the COP. So have a nice evening or nice morning or day, depending on where you are based. And we talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.